A deadly plutonium sphere killed two scientists in horrific, agonizing ways. The quiet lake in Cameroon suddenly released a cloud of invisible gas, suffocating over 1,700 people in minutes. And in London, toxic smog filled the city for five straight days, making for one of the deadliest air pollution disasters in history. These are disturbing scientific accidents that changed the world. Lake Neos in Cameroon didn't look dangerous, but on August 21st of 1986, it killed over 1,700 hundred people and thousands of animals in just minutes. Deep under the lake, carbon dioxide gas had been slowly building up over decades. Something triggered it, probably a small landslide or an earthquake, and all that gas just shot up to the surface. Because CO2 is heavier than air, it poured down into the surrounding villages. People collapsed, unable to breathe, and there was no warning. Nothing anyone could see. Animals were wiped out instantly. It was clear that this type of eruption, where a lake suddenly releases massive amounts of gas, is extremely rare, but catastrophic when it happens. Engineers eventually installed degassing tubes to prevent the same thing from happening again, but before that, nobody fully understood the risk. What makes this accident so disturbing is how quiet invisible it was. Most natural disasters, you know, like earthquakes or floods or volcanoes, you know, they come with noise, movement, warning signs. Lake Neos was a silent killer, but now scientists study other volcanic lakes around the world to make sure a disaster like this doesn't happen again. In 1945, there was this 14-pound sphere of plutonium sitting at Los Alamos, left over from a third atomic bomb they never dropped on Japan. Scientists had been messing around with it, doing experiments to see how close they could push it to going critical. On August 21st, late at night, a 24-year-old physicist named Harry Daglin was working alone in the lab, already breaking protocol. He's carefully stacking heavy bricks around the plutonium core. These bricks reflect neutrons, tiny particles from the plutonium, which makes the reaction more likely. He goes to place another brick, and it slips, drops right onto the core. Instant flash of heat and light. Harry immediately knows he's dead. He frantically knocked the brick off, but had already absorbed a lethal dose of radiation. The next 25 days were brutal. His hand blistered, skin was falling off, and he had waves of nausea as the radiation destroyed his cells from the inside out. He slipped into a coma and died under a month later. Nine months after Daglin died, Los Alamos scientists were still doing experiments with the same core. They nicknamed this type of experiment Tickling the Dragon's Tail, which kind of tells you everything about how reckless this was, and how reckless they knew it was. On May 21st, 1946, Louis Slotin is demonstrating the experiment to seven colleagues. He has two half-spheres made of beryllium, a type of metal, surrounding the plutonium core. These half-spheres also reflect neutrons, and the goal of the experiment is to see how close they can bring the core to a chain reaction without it actually going critical. He's manually holding them apart with just a screwdriver to keep the reaction under control. Well, one slip and the two halves could come together, triggering a deadly burst of radiation. Well, his hand slips. The hemispheres slam together. There's a blue flash of light, a wave of heat. Slotin doesn't freeze, though. He uses his bare hands to knock the hemispheres apart, stopping the reaction and probably saving everyone else, but he got blasted with a deadly amount of radiation in less than a second. He knew he was done for and started calculating who would survive based on their distance from the core. He was right about all of them. Nine days later, though, he died in agony. After that, Los Alamos finally melted down the demon. In December of 1952, London experienced five days of toxic air. Cold weather had trapped smoke and pollutants from coal burning in the city, creating this dense smog that didn't just make it hard to see, it made it hard to breathe. People woke up coughing, dizzy, and short of breath. Hospitals overflowed with people, and by the time the fog finally lifted, estimates say between 4,000 and 12,000 people had died, and tens of thousands more were seriously ill. And aside from respiratory problems, there were accidents. The smog was so thick it caused cars and buses to crash. It's considered one of the deadliest air pollution disasters in history. What's shocking though is that this was not a freak event. It was caused by factories and homes burning coal for heat. Toxic smoke was getting produced for years, but nobody realized that when combined with just the right weather conditions, 
could be lethal. After the disaster, the government passed the Clean Air Act in 1956, regulating coal burning and emissions in cities. And this incident changed how governments around the world thought about air pollution. In July 1976, a chemical plant in Seveso, Italy, released a cloud of dioxin, a highly toxic compound into the surrounding area. The plant was producing a chemical used in pesticides. A sudden reaction in the production process caused the deadly gas to escape. People nearby didn't know what was happening. Within hours, animals started dying, leaves and plants withered away, and people were getting skin rashes. Some children developed chloracne, a severe acne-like condition caused by chemical poisoning, which left scars for life. Over 3,000 people were evacuated, but the effects of this lingered on for decades. Studies showed an increased rate of cancer and other long-term health problems, but the disaster led to new industrial safety regulations in Europe, known as the Seveso Directive, which required plants to manage toxic chemicals more carefully and have emergency response plans. In Minamata, Japan, a chemical factory dumped wastewater containing methyl mercury into the bay. Unfortunately, people didn't realize what was happening until it was too late. People were eating fish from the contaminated water for years, not knowing that they were slowly poisoning themselves. The mercury accumulated in their bodies, causing neurological damage, tremors, numbness, vision, and hearing problems, and in some cases, death. Pregnant women who ate contaminated fish gave birth to children with severe deformities. The company responsible, Chiso Corporation, denied any connection at first, and the Japanese government was slow to get on. On this. Victims were dismissed and ignored for a long time. By the time legal action was finally taken, thousands had already been affected. Thalidomide was sold as a miracle drug for morning sickness in pregnant women during the late 50s. Doctors thought that it was completely safe, so for a while it was handed out all over Europe and North America. But then, the horrifying truth came out. It was causing severe birth defects. Kids were born with missing or deformed arms and legs, and in some cases organs didn't form properly. At first, the pharmaceutical companies denied that they had anything to do with these birth defects. Lawsuits eventually forced companies to pay victims out, and the scandal completely changed how substances are tested. Now, medications have to go through very strict testing, including studies on pregnant women, before they hit the market. See, so what made it so difficult here was that the drug seemed harmless to adults, and it was. It just wasn't for their own children. On the night of December 2nd, 1984, a chemical plant in Bhopal, India leaked a deadly gas into nearby neighborhoods. People were coughing, burning, struggling to breathe. Around 3,800 people died immediately. The disaster was caused by a combination of factors. Poor safety regulations ignored warning signs, and the chemical plant was running outdated equipment. Water somehow got into a chemical tank, setting off a massive reaction that released the gas. Hospitals were then flooded with victims, and no one knew how to protect themselves. The aftermath left the city dealing with poisoned soil and water, generations of chronic illnesses, legal battles that just dragged on for decades. On April 20th of 2010, the Deepwater Horizon oil rig exploded in the Gulf of Mexico. 11 workers died instantly. And for months, millions of barrels of crude oil spilled into the ocean, spreading for hundreds of miles along the coastline. Beaches were covered in thick black sludge. Birds and turtles were coated in oil, and fish and dolphins washed up dead. Fishing communities lost their livelihoods. Hospitals reported people with rashes, nausea, and breathing problems from the toxic mess. The rigs blowout preventers didn't work. On an oil rig, a blowout preventer is like the last line of defense. It's a huge valve system designed to automatically seal the well if the pressure from the oil and gas gets out of control. If the pressure builds too much, it's supposed to snap shut and keep everything contained. On Deepwater Horizon, the blowout preventer malfunctioned. That meant there was nothing stopping millions of barrels of oil from shooting into the ocean. Cleanup crews were sent in to dangerous conditions, handling toxic oil and chemicals without proper protection, any getting sick themselves. In April of 1979, something deadly escaped from a Soviet military lab in Sverdolsk. Airborne anthrax spores had leaked into the town, drifting through the air. People downwind started getting very sick. Fevers, trouble breathing, black spots started forming on their skin. A lot of people died 
died before doctors even had a clue what was going on. First, the government lied, saying it was contaminated meat causing this, but the truth was far worse. This was part of the USSR's secret biological weapons program, so there were no warnings, no evacuation, no plan to treat civilians exposed to one of the deadliest bacteria on Earth. Anthrax spores are extremely hardy. Breathe them in without getting treated immediately, and it's usually fatal. And the cover-up meant people kept walking into danger, thinking that they were safe. Hospitals were unprepared and many victims didn't make it because no one knew what they were really dealing with. The official story only started to come to light years later after the Cold War ended. At least 68 people died. Some estimates say the real number could be much higher. In the 70s, scientists realized the ozone layer over Antarctica was thinning. Now, this wasn't causing immediate deaths like in other disasters, but the implications were pretty terrifying. Ozone blocks harmful ultraviolet radiation from reaching Earth's surface. So, the more it erodes, the more cases of cancer we have, the more damage to the environment. What's caused this erosion is chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, chemicals used in refrigerators, spray cans, and factories. The hole over Antarctica was a wake-up call that humans were messing with the planet without even noticing it. For decades, scientists had warned that the chemicals we were spraying up into the air were destroying the ozone, but governments just ignored it. It wasn't until enough pressure built that the Montreal Protocol was signed in 1987 to start phasing out CFCs. That said, I've been your host, James, and I'll catch you, yes, you specifically, in the next video.